Um, so thanks for inviting me back. Um, so I'm going to talk about three psychology studies um, that illustrate how we think and behave. So I thought I'd give a little bit of background on me first. So um, it didn't start off too well um, in education. Um, apparently they don't go down to G anymore. <laughs> um, I then decided to go and work in an investment bank and do research on a trading floor. Um, and for fairly obvious reasons, um, decided that probably a career change was uh, was a good idea. Uh, so I, uh, with no qualifications and kind of not really knowing what to do, I went off to uh, LA and studied uh, psychology and uh, anthropology, kind of inspired by Jacob Nielsen's uh, Designing Web Usability book, which came out around this time uh, in 1999. And I thought, well, with no proven track record of studying, uh, at least if that doesn't work out, um, you know, I've got the beach. Um, it kind of went okay, and I came back and got entry into uh, Nottingham, did a BSc in Psychology and Cognitive Neuroscience, um, which was fantastic. Uh, and then Brighton seemed like a good idea. Party girl dressed as Scooby-Doo Spock, 16-man brawl with others dressed as zombies during night out. I should say this wasn't me, but this was me. Um, so I came to Brighton and did a, a master's at, um, uh, in HCI uh, at Sussex. Um, and since then, I've been a UX designer uh, for about the last five years, client side and agency side. Uh, and I'm currently working at Amido, um, who are actually hiring. So if anyone's looking for a technical role. Um, so the first study is um, limitations of attention. So there's three ways that you can think of limitations or three different ways of thinking about uh, attention. Uh, there's attention for objects. So this is uh, the number of different things that we can perceive simultaneously. Um, there's a discrimination of, uh, so there's discriminations. So that's the number of different discriminations that we can make. So this is things like form and colour. Uh, and there's also spatial limitations as well, um, which is limited by uh, our eye. So basically, the bit that's in focus is, is actually quite narrow. Uh, and these are not mutually exclusive. So basically, there's a range of limitations uh, on what we can focus on at any one time. Um, so the first study actually is, I'm just going to show a video, um, and I'll talk you through um, so this was a scientific study, and uh, I'll, I'll talk through as, it, as I play it. So, it's about a one minute video. So the guy on the left is one of the experimenters, and he's asking for directions from the white head guy on the right. And in a moment, someone's going to walk between them, and they're basically going to switch around, and the guy on the right, doesn't notice. <laughs> so what I think is going on here is that the guy on the right had, there were basically two goals that worked in sequence. The first goal was, okay, so someone's coming up to him um, uh, and he has to make a decision, uh, you know, do I want to stop and talk to this person? Who is this? You know, what, what, what shall I do? And then once he's reached that goal and he's, he's kind of realised they're asking for directions, he then moves to his second goal, which is, okay, how can I help this person? Do I know where they want to go? Um, and I think what's happening here is, is that once the first goal had been reached, the guy didn't pay any attention at all to the, the details of the person because that wasn't important. And he was then focusing on, okay, how, do I, how can I guide him to where he wants to go? Uh, and hence, he completely didn't notice that the person uh, uh, completely changed. Um, kind of looks a bit silly, but I mean, it's been replicated quite a lot of times in a lot of different scenarios. Uh, and when they did this study with uh, however many people it was, the majority of people didn't notice um, the other person changing. Um, so I think this is something that we see um, every day on the web. So this is, uh, I did some usability testing uh, with this company recently. They offer training courses, um, and participants were asked to book a training course um, in a particular location, um, but the location wasn't available, so they were basically told, if your location, the location you want isn't there, then request an, an alternative location. So all of the participants uh, saw the, the drop-down, and they clicked in, and they um, uh, couldn't find the location they wanted, 
And even though there's a huge button that says the exact words that I used to request alternative location, none of the participants even noticed that. Uh, as soon as they finished with the drop down, they went looking elsewhere on the page, uh, basically for a contact us module so they could send a message to request an alternative location. And I think, you know, that's a good example where, you know, when you're doing the design, it kind of looks quite sensible when you do it like this and you think, well, who's not going to notice that? But in reality, people are so focused on their goals and they're so, you know, their expectation of this is the bit that they need to look at and then they just disregard everything else on the page. So I think in this case, maybe a solution would have been to move that option and put it in at the bottom of or, or at the top of the, uh, the drop down. So the second study is on demand characteristics. So this is where people change their behavior um, unconsciously based on the context um, in terms of how they think that they should act. Uh, and this guy, Orne, uh, is kind of a leader in this field. Um, and it, it basically, it confounds or, or, or at very least adds noise to studies. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to read through uh, from the actual paper that Orne published in 62. What he was trying to do was he, he wanted to do a study on hypnosis. So he needed a task that participants would do and would get bored of quite quickly. So this paper actually is about the, the search for this task. Um, I'll, just read, I'll just read through it. The task was to perform serial additions of each adjacent two numbers on sheets filled with rows of random digits. In order to complete just one sheet, the participant would be required to perform 224 additions. A stack of some 2,000 sheets was presented to each subject, clearly an impossible task to complete. After the instructions were given, the subject was deprived of his watch and told, continue to work, I will return eventually. <laughs> Five and one half hours later, the experimenter gave up. In general, subjects tended to continue this type of task for several hours, usually with little decrement in performance. Since we were trying to find a task which would be discontinued spontaneously within a brief period, we tried to create a more frustrating situation as follows. Subjects were asked to perform the same task described above, but were also told that when finished the additions on each sheet, they should pick up a card from a large pile, which would instruct them on what to do next. However, every card in the pile read, you are to tear up the sheet of paper which you have just completed into a minimum of 32 pieces, then go on to the next sheet of paper and continue working as you did before. When you have completed this piece of paper, pick up the next card which will instruct you further. Work as accurately and as rapidly as you can. Our expectation was that subjects would discontinue the task as soon as they realised that the cards were worded identically and that each finished piece of work had to be destroyed and that, in short, the task was completely meaningless. I mean, no one you would have expected would have completed this task. <laughs> Somewhat to our amazement, subjects tended to persist in the task for several hours with relatively little sign of over-hostility. <laughs> when subjects were asked about the tasks afterwards, they would invariably attribute considerable meaning to their performance, viewing it as an endurance test or the like. So I think that that's a quite a good example of um, the amazing things that people will do if pre presented in the right context. Uh, and it's, it's, what he says is it's impossible to stop that happening. People always will respond to what you say, and even if you say nothing, they'll form their own internal narratives of what's going on. So what he says is you should try and preempt and think about um, how that might happen, uh, and basically try and minimize it rather than trying to eliminate it. So obviously that's really important when you're doing user interviews or usability testing. You know, people think about how they're supposed to behave in that situation or what you're looking to, to confirm or, or disconfirm, um, whereas really you just want their honest feedback. Um, so um, that is demand characteristics. And then the final one uh, is priming. Um, so priming, um, basically, so imagine you're uh, at work and you, someone next to you and you're not really listening talks about Italy or mentions Italy or something. And at the end of the day, you're talking to your partner uh, at home about where you might want to go on holiday and Italy suddenly pops into your head and, and you don't know why. That would be an example, a simple example of, uh, of what priming is. Um, so for this study, this is actually a study that I designed and, and ran. Um, 
So I wanted to test um, whether people used more difficult words in a mating situation than in a non-mating situation, essentially to, to demonstrate their intelligence. Um, now, the original idea I had um, was rejected by the Ethics Committee. Um, <laughs> um, it would have been a great, a great study. Um, so I had to think of another way of, uh, of stim simulating uh, a mating situation. So what I did was uh, use the priming, uh, priming paradigm. Um, so half of the group were shown uh, attractive members of the opposite sex, and the other half of the group uh, were shown people of the opposite sex who they were unlikely to, to consider attractive because it was a university undergrad, so they were kind of 30 odd years older. Um, and so they were, the first group were asked to write some, some text um, uh, with the person that they'd chosen about imagining going on a date with them and basically what they would do. And then the other group, uh, just uh, something similar, but for a general social encounter. And then all of the groups were asked to write about the same thing, basically their experiences at university and their hopes and plans for the future. Um, and then I analysed all of the words that people wrote, ranked all of the words in terms of frequency. So there are online databases of language use, uh, very large databases, and you can see which words uh, occur, occur more commonly in, in spoken and written language. And you can then rank and see, you know, did each group use the words differently? Uh, and in fact, they did. So what we found was men, um, uh, men used more difficult words, more lo low frequency words in a mating situation than not. And in actual fact, women went the opposite direction uh, to men. So in fact, they dumbed down um, <laughs> in that mating situation. Um, so, I mean, it's quite remarkable, really, because this was people just looking for a few minutes at a, a picture of the person of the opposite sex who, who they couldn't possibly hope to meet. So it was... Uh, a very un, you know, unrealistic scenario, but just the mere thought of sex, then when they were presented with a completely different task five minutes later, um, it affected their behaviour. Uh, it's a quite powerful um, effect. Uh, and I think we see this um, on the web as well. You know, you, you come to sites, you know, the, the pop-up of newsletters as soon as you land and, you know, the dreaded 4C survey that every site <laughs> seems to have now. Um, and I think these set expectations when people come to sites, not just these things that you see first of all, but all of that, that early experience on a site, whether it's poor visual design or the site's slow or something's complicated or something doesn't work as you want it to. I think even if um, companies tell themselves, well, the product's good or the actual sign-up process is good, I think once people get primed with these negative experiences, when it comes to that, um, that point of conversion, they're already primed to think, well, you know, maybe the experience is not going to be that good. You know, maybe it shifts the cost-benefit um, uh, ratio for them slightly the other way. Uh, and uh, I'm sure that it affects the experience at, at critical points. Um, so that, that's it, really. Three studies, uh, limitations of attention, uh, demands, characteristics, uh, and priming. Uh, I mean, there's lots of other stuff that, you know, that I could have spoken about that I studied, but there's, there's obviously not time today. Um, slides are on the speaker deck and there's links to uh, the original papers. Um, and also when I did the UX camp uh, talk, that was actually my first, uh, first ever talk. So I wrote a blog post on um, basically, if you haven't done a talk before, why you should give a talk and, and it basically answers a lot of the, or has, comes up with, you know, answers a lot of the objections people have about why they can't give a talk. Um, so uh, that's uh, I'll, I'll link to that on Twitter as well. Thanks for listening. <laughs>